Welcome to The Lawyer's Podcast, a series of conversations about law practice. Each week, we talk with legal entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are your hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Aaron Street, and this is episode 195 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Rick Horowitz about strategic legal writing. Today's podcast is brought to you by LawPay, Smokeball, Law Clerk, and New Law Business Model. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support, so stay tuned, and we will tell you more about them later on. I'm excited to announce that we've launched a new program here at Lawyerist. Yay, a new uh, name for things. Yay, new things. <laughs> um, all members of our Insider Plus Lab and Lab Pro communities, which you could become a part of, are now all eligible for our Affinity Partner Program. We've partnered with dozens of our favorite technology and service providers in the industry to come up with custom deals and discounts for our community. And the way to get those deals is to be a part of either the Insider Plus Lab or Lab Pro program. Yeah. So what we're trying to do here is figure out what are the great products that we know people in our community are using or want to use anyway, and then trying to help you get good discounts on them. If you're in the Lab or Lab Pro, you already have access to this. So if you haven't seen the notification, already. All you have to do is log in on Lawyerist and visit the Affinity page and you can start claiming discounts. Some for products you may already have. Some of our partners are agreeing to give discounts just because you are in the lab. Which is pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, pretty and cool. if you're not a part of any of those programs yet, feel free to dig around on the website and learn more about those discounts and offers. Our goal is not to sell you stuff. Our goal is to help you find the right products and services you need to grow your firm the way you want to. And we're hopeful that with our collection of partners that the right things for you are in that mix and that we've negotiated some great deals for you so that you can save money and get the right things you need. If you just want the deals, uh, join Insider Plus. You can find it on the front page of Lawyerist. Go under the community menu, under join. It's 89 bucks a year. And obviously, we are confident that you will save at least $89 in the course of your first year. And if that's all you save, I'd be astonished. But it hopefully is should be a no-brainer if you use any of the products that are already in the program. Yeah, our, our goal in negotiating the discounts was that for most of the vendors, if you take advantage of just one or two of the offers, you will more than pay for your annual membership in Insider Plus. Plus, you get other stuff as part right. of that. Yeah. It's not the only benefit of being in the Insider Plus community. A whole bunch of free resources and things on our website, invitations to our Facebook group, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And if you take advantage of lots of the offers in the program, then it's going to save you crazy amounts of money, in which case then it's one of the most smoking deals out there. Yeah. So hopefully you can just go like make an actual comparison and just save money. So join that. Uh, the way to get into the Affinity Partner Program, once again, is to join Insider Plus. Or if you are already in Lab or Lab Pro, you already have access to this. If you're curious about joining Lab or Lab Pro, you can just go to lawyers.com slash lab and find out more about it. So now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with Kristen Tyler from Law Clerk, and then we'll jump into my conversation with Rick. Hi, I'm Kristen Tyler, one of the co-founders of Law Clerk. Hi, Kristen. Thanks for being with us again today. And I should mention... Law Clerk is one of the very first members of our new Affinity Program, which is a benefit for our Insider Plus and Lab members. And you can get a discount with Law Clerk by investigating those Affinity benefits if you are either a Lab member or an Insider Plus member. So Kristen, we just both got back from ClioCon where we missed each other, but tell me about your takeaways from that. Well, it was a good event. And it's funny because I know I saw you from a distance several times and we were both so busy having some <laughs> great conversations. It just didn't happen. But yeah. Cleo was awesome. Um, we enjoyed seeing some people that we've known a long time and, of course, making some new friends. I especially enjoyed my dinner with Aaron Street and the rest of the people that attended our little dinner one night. It was awesome to get to know some of those folks better. So thank you for coordinating those great events while we're down there. Yeah, I'm glad you could come. We had an awesome show. The audience was great. They were very receptive 
adaptive to what we're doing here with connecting busy attorneys with our nationwide network of freelance lawyers. We signed up a ton of attorneys. And in fact, a lot of them turned around and went into the sessions and posted projects immediately, which was just phenomenal. We love oh, that. Oh, so you were able to like watch that happening. That's cool. Yeah, we were. <laughs> they'd come back out of the session. We're like, you just posted a project. And they were like, yeah, I did. I can't wait. So awesome. um, it was really wonderful for us. Uh, and so the theme of the conference was experience in the nature of the client experience, the customer experience, the user experience. I assume that that made you think about ways that Law Clerk can be used to enhance the client experience. Absolutely. That's something we think about all the time. And I think it's something your listeners are especially tuned into as well. I think that lawyers, listeners really care about their clients and wanting to get them the best possible legal services available. So is there an example that comes to mind of a way that Locklear can really enhance the client experience? Oh, sure. Sure. You know, I think there's a lot of ways we can enhance. Probably the one that is the biggest in my mind is the fact that lawyers can help improve their client experience by leveraging the talents of our freelance lawyers to tap into subject matter expertise. And that's a bit of a mouthful. So what does that mean? One example that comes to mind, a story that we love to tell is a story of one of our users, an early adapter signed up early on, and he's a pretty high profile constitutional law, criminal law attorney. He was working on a writ to the U.S. Supreme Court, which is pretty impressive in and of itself. He came to us, said, hey, I had this one issue on my writ that I need someone to dig into. I need to find someone who's really well versed with this issue. It's dictum, which What's the last time you heard the word dictum, Sam? <laughs> right? Law school, I think. Yeah. Law school. Same here. <laughs> and so we said, okay, we helped him get the project posted. Through the network, we were able to connect him with an attorney in an entirely different geographical area that he otherwise never would have connected with that happened to have written several law review articles and other scholarly articles on this particular issue of dictum. The freelancer was able to come in, help do a little additional research, help do some drafting, to help boost that writ petition to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the hiring attorney told us he was just thrilled. He said this freelancer brought up issues that their team, even though they'd been practicing 20 plus years, hadn't even thought of. And so to me, one of the biggest potential areas, law clerk and our network of freelance lawyers can help add client value and improve their experience is by allowing them to leverage the unique talent of all of these freelancers out there that have capacity to come in and help on cases. So the way to think about it, or at least one way to think about it is less, you know, just hire a legal research assistant, but to think about hiring co-counsel. In a way, yes. I mean, they're still working for you in the background. So you're in the spotlight. You're the one who's going to be filing a petition, arguing, shining at court. But our freelancers aren't just people that want to do doc review and simple research memos. We have a lot of sophisticated people out there that can really come in and boost the the work you're already doing and take it to the next level. Very cool. If listeners are interested in learning more about Law Clerk or in the business model, best practices or ethics of using freelance lawyers, you can go to lawclerk.legal slash lawyerist and download a free white paper or just learn more about Law Clerk. Kristen, thanks so much for being with us today. Always a pleasure. Take care. Hi, I'm Rick Horowitz. I'm the founder and wordsmith in chief of Prime Pros LLC. I do writing services, editing, uh, proofreading, a variety of other things, teaching lawyers and other professionals. And we're here to talk about helping lawyers write and sound, when they write, more like actual human beings. Rick, I assume from your title that you like the word wordsmith? I do. I think there's a craft <laughs> involved in uh, in uh, writing effectively, regardless of what profession you're uh, pursuing. But I think it's a particular issue uh, with respect to lawyers. They tend to know the law, know their area of the law better than they're able to communicate what they know. Marshall and Aaron and I had an argument the other day about um, whether or not wordsmith was a good word. And we decided that uh, we liked word crafting better. <laughs> OK, you're you're entitled when you do your business card. You got yours. Uh, I won't have to worry about the competition. That's great. I personally like wordsmith, but it was what we could agree on. There you go. Sounds good. Sounds good. And I use it as a as a noun rather than a verb. But I've heard people talk about wordsmithing various documents, too. So uh, totally. we'll let that slide for the moment. Um, All right. Well, t- tell me why you do what you do. And, you know, what's the frame for how you come to be talking about legal writing and wordsmithing when it comes to law? 
Well, I come from a varied background. I have been a lawyer. I have been a journalist. I have been a writing coach and trainer. Uh, I have worked with, as I said, with lawyers, but also with journalists over the years. I've also taught business writing on the college level. My job in each of those cases, I guess, has been to try to get people to be more effective at what they do. And that varies, obviously, depending on what particular profession they're writing. But I think some of the principles that I talk about and that we discuss in our sessions are more broadly applicable. And I think with particular attention to lawyers, there's a gap really between their knowledge, their comfort with their subject area. And their ability to convey that information, that advice, that guidance uh, to the variety of people they have to communicate with. It's not always writing lawyer to lawyer. Uh, it's not always writing lawyer to expert lawyer. Even if the other the, there's a lawyer on the other end of the document, that lawyer may not be as plugged into the particular subject as you are doing the writing. Mm-hmm. So I think there are uh, potholes along the way that make lawyers less effective in their writing. And as I say, my job is to try to give them tools and tips and strategies, questions to ask, things to bear in mind that will help them make better choices that will not necessarily have them default to uh, lawyer speak when they try to communicate with people and that the result is more understanding when they want to be understood. And I realize there are times they don't, (laughs) uh, but more understanding, at least when they want to. Uh, My working assumption is that most of the time you want most of the people who are reading what you're writing to understand what you're saying to them. Yeah. Seems only logical that you'd want that. Uh, Then the question is, how do you do that more effectively? How do you make better choices? How do you ask better, more useful questions to help you make those choices. I have this buried in the middle of my note, but back in August when you and I were talking about this podcast, you said that one of the core tenets was to be deliberate about your writing and the choices that you make, not use the default. And I, it feels to me like that's where a lot of lawyers fall down is we don't smith or craft or whatever word you prefer so much as we sort of copy and derive our writing from what came before. I think that's and right. And so we're not really deliberate. We let other people dictate our choices. I think that's right. Everybody's got models, and that's understandable. And you train on models, and that's understandable. Uh, but you also have to realize along the way that the fact that it's a model doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are not wearing powdered wigs anymore either. I mean, there was a time when that was the model for lawyers. But I think it's true as well with with writing and with communicating. You've got different platforms now. You've got different types of audiences you're trying to reach. And so it seems to me that the sort of default is not always the proper answer. I think, I mean, it's, it's understandable. I think every profession has sort of a secret handshake. Mm-hmm. linguistically in terms of the ter- you know the terms they use the language they use uh, the sort of shorthand code they speak in uh, and that's understandable and it's acceptable in certain areas in certain types of documents writing to certain audiences the problem is it seems to me and to the people who are taking the class that so much of the writing you do is not that document is not the formal legal document is not going to someone who knows the field as well as you do and that can be lay people, it can be lawyers, it can be judges who are not expert at uh, reinsurance, for instance. And the idea that everybody knows the same language is, I think, a mistaken idea. And I think it's a harmful idea if, again, what you're trying to do is be understood when you write things, when you communicate things. Well, so let's start at the beginning then, and and let's walk through how to think strategically about legal writing. You know, what what should we do before we even start writing, I guess? Well, I call it the writing you do before you start writing. I know a lot of people think when they ask, you know, how, how long does it take you to write something, uh, they'll ask, you know, how long have your fingers been on the keyboard? Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that is that is well into the process of writing. There's there's a lot of background and a lot of preparation in writing. I like to, to simplify things for, for my sessions and tell them that most writing really comes down to answering four basic questions, and they are, what's in and what's out, where do you put it, and how do you say it? They go to questions of what's to be included and and not included, and that's the great lawyer's balancing act of complete versus concise. And lawyers have all sorts of problems trying to make sure they hit that right. And then the where do you put it is how do you organize the stuff you've decided to include 
And then finally, the how do I say it is tone, which is, I think, underappreciated, but of major importance if you're trying to be accessible to your audience. Now, having suggested that those are sort of the, the core questions you have to ask when you write virtually anything, I then suggest to folks and, and would offer to you that the two key factors you need to consider in, in answering those questions, uh, and they change by document, by you know each time out, are what is your goal? What is your mission? What are you trying to accomplish in this particular piece of writing? Is it informing? Is it activating? Is it motivating? Is it threatening? Is it reassuring? Is it organizing? What is it you're trying to do? Because your choices in out, where do I put it and how do I say it, will differ according to what your goal is. And then also crucial, Who's the audience? Who are you writing to this time? I mean, I tell a story in my class occasionally of you go out on a Saturday night, you have a good time. You have a really good time, really, really good time. Sunday morning, you get two phone calls. One's from your BFF, one's from grandma. They want to know how your Saturday night was. <laughs> exactly. That's about where the Snickers tend to start. Yeah, no, it seems, seems you are obviously talking to different audiences the whole time. On the subject of what are you trying to accomplish it strikes me that, you know, I've been sitting in court and sometimes I've been on the receiving end of this where what I'm trying to do is win an argument and it's not clear to the court that if I win the argument, I win the case or that it can do what I want. And that that seems like a way to avoid that problem where you're standing up there and you're you're convinced you're scoring points on how right you are on the logic. And then the court says, but but counsel, what's the rule that lets us do that or even if we, even if I agree with you. I think that's a great point. And if you're better aware of your audience and what they need to hear, this particular audience of judges needs to hear how the rule applies. Yep. And so the types of arguments you would marshal, uh, how you would sequence them, how you would structure them, where you place greater or lesser emphasis, you might still want those other arguments that you say are winning points, but you probably don't want to give them as much emphasis in front of this audience, because at least according to your hypothetical, you know that this audience wants to hear about the rule right. and the application of the rule. So those are the choices you make. If you're dealing with a different audience, you might be making totally different decisions about what things you include, what kind of background you need to employ, how much jargon you use or technical terms you use or have to define. Uh, all those choices are different. And my, my goal is to get people before they commit to what's going to go on the page or what's going to go on the screen to spend a little bit of the time, even if they have just a short time. If you've got an hour to write a memo, uh, I would still suggest spending those first eight or 10 or 12 minutes thinking through some of the stuff rather than just pouring it out. I think you'll use the remaining time as short as it is uh, more effectively if you've made those calls first, if you at least ask yourself those questions first. You mentioned thinking about what goes in and what goes out, what to emphasize and what not to. And um, I mm -hmm. think you mentioned kind of the tone and language, which are strategic choices that go against the everything and the kitchen sink approach that I think a lot of lawyers default to. Say more about, about that sort of taking stock of those tools and arguments and facts and things. Yeah, I think the kitchen sink is the safer choice in some respects, because you can at least tell yourself, well, I've thrown everything in I can. And it's harder to fault yourself. You're not leaving anything out. So if something goes wrong, you can say, well, at least I put everything in there. The problem is, and I, I hear this from lawyers, I have shared videos with my classes of folks who do appellate litigation talking about choosing only the strongest arguments because putting everything in tends to uh, dilute the focus. Mm -hmm. It suggests or connotes a certain lack of confidence in your best arguments. Uh, and there's a dispute on this. There's no one answer to this. I've had people in, in sessions at various places say, you know, essentially, well, I heard of a case once where the lawyer had eight arguments and threw in all eight of them, and the eighth one was a throwaway. And it turns out that the eighth one was the one that caught the judge's attention and turned the case around. And I can't say that's not true. I'm sure that's happened once. Well, see, that's the thing. I mean, <laughs> like I, I've, compared it, I've compared it to buying earthquake insurance in a place that never has earthquakes. Right. I mean, there may be a time when it's necessary, but maybe that money can be better spent on other things. And likewise, uh, I've had people in class sort of contend with that, that particular argument and say, what's harder to prove is the case that didn't go your way because you did dilute or divert the judge's attention. Right. Uh, that you didn't focus the, the judges on the particular things that you thought were strongest. And while you won't hear in the decision that was the reason, 
So it's harder to, to tell yourself, I need to fix that. They claim that as often that's the case. We have a couple of lawyers who used to work at Hogan and Hartson, who, who had a video for University of Virginia Law School that I've used from time to time. And they used to work under uh, John Roberts in appellate work there. And they said they asked him at some point, I think after he'd gone on to the court, what his biggest discovery or change in thinking was. And he says he would he would use many fewer arguments. He would present many fewer arguments. Mm -hmm. And I realize even there, there's a question below you're keeping your right of, of appeal by using more, but when you get to the court above, uh, he was suggesting that he thinks it's more effective to focus on your three or four strongest arguments. At least this is the way his former associates or former partners at, at Hogan and Hartson characterized him and make some effective choices. But I think the balancing act there is no one answer is going to fit every situation. But be aware, at least, that the idea of kitchen sink, as you put it, is not the only approach and may not be the best approach. Well, and, you know, one of the things that comes to my mind, because in, in the rest of our world, we're always talking about, you know, how do lawyers stay relevant and maintain an advantage over algorithms and machines and AI and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And the answer is always, well, I'm a lawyer. I use judgment and I give advice. Well, I mean, bullshit. If all you're doing is putting together and everything in the kitchen sink argument, any any knucklehead well, can judgment. Don't you need judgment there too? Yeah. Don't you need judgment <laughs> there uh, to make choices that will make the most effective argument to get accomplished in this document, in this filing, in this piece of correspondence, in this press release? Yeah. A any any algorithm, any any stupid computer can assemble all of the potential arguments. And here's some stock reasoning behind them. You don't need a lawyer to do that. I would think that's a great argument. Yeah, yeah I think so. Thank you. So yeah. um, what about tone and language and word choice? You've, you've mentioned uh, how much jargon a couple of times. Um, well, how do you make that choice? What, what is the right amount of jargon? Well, again, the right amount of jargon, again, <laughs> depends on what you're trying to do and what you're trying to, yeah, and, and, and who you're trying to do it with. If you're writing to somebody who's an expert in the subject you're writing, well, you can short circuit things. You don't have to define terms in great detail. You can use acronyms, perhaps, if, if those are convenient shortcuts to the conversation or to the information you're trying to provide. Whereas if you're writing to a layperson, not so much. You, you have to spell some of those things out. You have to provide more background. If it's the case that as a lawyer, you're trying to have the person at the other end, a client, for instance, believe that you have put yourself on the other side of the table, you can see things from their perspective, then using the language that they can feel comfortable with is key to that. If mm -hmm. you sound distant and unapproachable, even in the words you use, that conveys a certain distancing in your relationship to that client or to that other party. Uh, you need to at least be aware of that. And I'm not, believe me, I'm not saying that you need to talk in um, colloquial terms all the time or even any of the time. You might. Uh, but I've had classes where I ask, do you use contractions at all in your writing? Right. And you'll see virtually no hands go up in the air. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I can't do this and such. I can't do that. Is it really I cannot? Does that sound very different to you, to your ear? I had one uh, participant, a woman in class in Boston uh, some time ago, who after no hands had gone up to that question, said her, her shop uses contractions, but they're a nonprofit. You know, and I, the, the class cracked up because, I mean, it was sort of a reasonable reaction to who your audience is, presumably, as a nonprofit. That's, that's such a weird thing, but okay. Yeah, that they could be more conversational. <laughs> What's interesting, too, Sam, is I mentioned that story to another class in D.C. a couple of weeks ago, and I had a woman raise her hand and said, well, we're a nonprofit, too, and we made the decision, the conscious decision, not to use contracted forms because we're a nonprofit and we wanted to be taken seriously, and we were afraid if we went to the less formal language, we wouldn't be taken as seriously. Neither of those is the only right answer. Both of those are exactly the right answer for their situation. And I mean, it's that kind of adjustment, it seems to me, that you make along the way or you get to make along the way, you're allowed to make, uh, that makes your writing more effective. Are you trying to present as somebody who is more accessible or somebody who's a little bit more elevated and lofty? Right. It goes back to be deliberate. Make a choice. Don't just use the default. Exactly. So. Yeah, I think you've got more. I mean, you mentioned earlier, you know, more tools in the toolbox than you know you do or that you remember you do. 
And among the tools you've got is tone. Yep. Uh, I, I talk sometimes about what a concept I've developed called word fonts, it's sort of the linguistic equivalent to type fonts. You know, a certain typeface will convey a certain feel to it. And another one will be a you know, Times Roman will be more formal than an Arial or a Futura font. I think it's the same thing with words. If you're using, you know, moms and dads, it sounds different from mothers and fathers. Mm -hmm. uh, you get to choose where you want to put it. Man sounds different from guy, sounds different from fella, sounds different from fellow, sounds different from dude. <laughs> you know, um, those are all supposedly... I'm going straight to Fast Case after this and trying to figure out how many times the word dude has appeared in the Supreme Court. Dude gets used, yeah, probably not as often <laughs> as some of those <laughs> others, but I'm guessing fella doesn't get there very much either. But I yep. mean, again, they're supposedly synonyms for adult male, but you can listen to them and you can tell instantly sort of where they fall on the continuum of formality and informality. And my argument is it's less sort of an on-off switch, uh, that you're, I'm either being formal or I'm being casual, uh, mm -hmm. but that it's more like a mixing board, that there's a continuum that you can adjust things. Or you do typically want to be consistent, and that's where the word font concept comes in, that in the same way you typically take a typeface and use it throughout the document, uh, in most cases, there are exceptions to all this stuff. You would probably want to say, if you're saying mothers, you would probably want to say mothers and fathers. If you if you were being mom and dad, you wouldn't say moms and fathers. You wouldn't mm -hmm. say mothers right. and dads, typically. There may be exceptions to that. I can think of situations where you might. But typically, you're trying to find a level of formality, a level of approachability that you think is the right tone, again, for this document, for this purpose for this audience and you get to make some choices and tone i think is one of the underappreciated choices you get to make but i think it's key well we need to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors and when we come back we'll talk about getting started writing we'll be right back smokeball practice management software exists to streamline small law firms and reduce the stress of running a small business with smokeball your firm is much more organized productive and profitable meaning you and your staff can breathe easy with less stress Visit smokeball.com slash lawyers today to learn more and book a demo. Like what you see? Lawyers podcast listeners are eligible for 50% off onboarding. With Smokeball at your firm, it's less stress and more success. If you're not 100% happy with your law practice right now, chances are you want more. More income from your practice, more fulfillment from your work, and more freedom to enjoy your life. There is a new law business model that is allowing passionate attorneys to reclaim their lives and love practicing law again. Alexis Neely has been training lawyers for over a decade on the new law business model she created to build her own million dollar law practice. And now, the lawyers she has trained in that new law business model have their own high six and seven figure law practices, all without sacrificing time with their families and only working with clients they love to serve. It is possible to experience the exhilaration of a thriving law practice, do the most meaningful legal work, have a real impact in your clients' lives, and have complete control over your schedule. Discover this new law business model now by watching the free video workshop series at newlawbusinessmodel.com slash lawyerist. Did you know that attorneys who accept online payments get paid 39% faster on average than those who use traditional payment methods? With LawPay, the only payment solution offered through the ABA Advantage program, you can easily accept client payments online, via email, or in person. No equipment needed. Visit lawpay.com slash lawyerist to sign up and get your first three months free. Trust the only payment solution developed for attorneys and recommended by 48 state bars, LawPay. So we're back. Uh, Rick, okay, so we've talked about sort of pre-writing, being strategic, thinking through the approach you want to take, the audience, the arguments you want to include and exclude and emphasize and de-emphasize. Mm -hmm. So let's say we've done all that and we've filled a couple pages with notes, or at least we've got some ideas in our head, and mm -hmm. we finally sit down in front of our keyboard or our dictaphone if we are of a certain age <laughs> and uh, to start writing. And how should we do that? Uh, again, I mean, this will sound like a bit of a punt, but again, there is no one answer. There are people who swear by absolutely detailed outlines. There are other people who do what some folks in our class have called, you know, the, the basic brain dump, that everything you've got in your head goes on the screen first so you don't forget it, so that you have it there, that you don't uh, lose anything in trying to craft the perfect sentence. You don't forget what, what you wanted to say further down the document. You get it all out there on a screen, on a glass board, uh, and, and work with, with it that way. Uh, I've had people in class who use uh, various mind mapping 
approaches, you know, sort of relational uh, databases and relational structure where they can put things on a glass board, for instance, and notice relationships among the various facts, among the various cases, among the various holdings they're dealing with, and can see things that a more linear, straight outline form wouldn't show them. And again, I, I make sort of personal testimony in some of these classes that when I was doing my syndicated column, which I did for years, uh, just 600 words or thereabouts, fairly short thing, and you're not in trying to master or you know round up so much information that's not in danger of spinning out of control, uh, my outline might be three lines on a three by five card or a four by six card, one quote and two you know words that are key words to a punchline here and there. Uh, but as I write longer pieces, magazine pieces, feature pieces, but, and certainly legal documents. And when I was doing that, uh, my approach was absolutely the other way. It was an outline in great detail, just about every sentence having its own entry in the outline. Uh, and my, my theory there was that it allowed me to make all the in and out choices and all the structural choices first so that when the time came to do the writing, I could concentrate on crafting the best sentences, the best paragraphs, the best flow of argument that I could do. Now, I offer that up to people in class in the same way I offer up mind mapping and, and free writing and things of that sort, understanding that some of those will work better for some people, some will work better for others. I would jump out of a window before I would use mind mapping because I'm not a <laughs> right. good spatial thinker i'm more well, I think linear you, you have to figure out how your brain wants to write you know like my my approach is kind of an organic i write the whole thing at once because i'm like oh i want to make sure that i use this phrasing with this argument and then later i erase that and try something else and and i find a new case you pour it all out onto the screen or onto the page or onto the dictaphone at one time you know i do and i and i fill it up and i rearrange it and i i write a little here a little there a little up top a little down low mm -hmm. um but i almost tell, always start with you know, if the type of document is going to have a recitation of the facts, I almost always start with that because I always find that telling the story is something I can do more or less from beginning to end. And, sure, sure. And it, and it it frames the argument. Like I've always really appreciated those old, um, I think it was learned hands decisions where you already, you already had made up your mind and you knew which way it was going to come out before you got to the end of the fact statement. And I've always liked that approach. Mm -hmm. Because I think the facts you choose and the way you set them up really matters and it can give, can give right. that key. And so th that that's my approach and it, it has to do with I guess my brain is story driven and um, and can't focus on one thing for any too, <laughs> any amount of time. <laughs> so it works for me. But yeah, I've had I've had uh, people in class that have basically had sort of the panic of the blank screen. Yeah, they have so much trouble getting started. And part of it, it seems to me in talking to them is they want the first sentence out of the box to be perfect. And that becomes a roadblock. And I sort of do what you've just suggested. I was at a, a journal, did a journalism workshop some years ago in uh, Minnesota, and one of the people in the class said that when she gets blocked, uh, the way she starts is she puts the phrase "once upon a time," comma. <laughs> And no, but exactly what you were saying before, Sam, she's story driven. People are hardwired to tell stories. Now, she's absolutely convinced she knows yeah. that that phrase once upon a time is never going to appear in the final document. <laughs> but it's sort of pump priming to tell a story and it gets her going onto the page. And if that works for you, great. Uh, now, the reason I tell people about, you know, both the three by five card for the columns and the tight outline for the longer pieces with more material I have to honcho is to let them know that even what you're saying is true. You know, how does your brain work? It may be that your brain works different ways for different documents. Yeah. I mean, or for different needs. If you only have a little bit of information to convey, I don't expect you to do a full fledged outline for, for an email blast. Right. Uh, but you know, if you're doing a, a filing of greater detail of greater length, um, it's been my experience. And I, again, I pass it out just for, if it works for you, try it. You know, or you think it might work for you, try it in the same way free writing might work for you or mind mapping might work for you. Uh, try that. But I have found that the different approaches are most effective for different circumstances, which, again, goes back to what are you trying to do today? What's your goal? What's your document? I mean, if you're writing for somebody who's going to be receiving their information on a mobile device, uh, the research typically shows that most people don't go more than two or three screens deep. Well, how does that affect how you organize, how you structure what you're presenting? You may have to top load and front load the things you're, you're presenting with the idea that they're not going to get to the fourth screen. So you're making different kinds of choices. I'm curious, how do you think about the traditional 
law school structure IRAC, um, and, and particularly the, the effectiveness of making sure that you explain the rule or the standard or the logic before you start applying it to the facts of the case or the issue or the negotiation or whatever it is at sure. hand? I think, I think it's a good guide. I think it's a good model. It's a good place to start. I read recently somebody uh, comparing it to a good basic white sauce <laughs> when you're cooking. That it's, you need to know how to do it, and then you start playing variations off it, uh, whether you know IRAC or CRAC or TREAT. All of those have, have their places. I've, I've read that some people who think those are virtually identical, it's just different mm -hmm. lawyers or law professors or textbook writers coming up with their, their own acronyms. And I think for certain documents, any, of, any version of that uh, is useful. But I've also had someone in class offer up one that most people in class had not seen. And I, I realize I'm giving away punchlines here, but if you come to see me, you can make believe you haven't heard before. And um, <laughs> they, they, the acronym is ATFQ. Okay. Not CRAC, not IRAC, not T-R-E-A-T. It's ATFQ. And I ask if anybody has seen or knows what that is, and typically nobody does. And then I slip to the next slide and ATFQ uh, Wait, my, is it address the fucking question? Answer the freaking question oh. is how they put it, <laughs> although they admitted that there might be some change in the third word. You know, different variants are out there. Uh, but often the classic example, I've heard this in a bunch of classes, if somebody want, asks you what time it is, they don't want the history of the wristwatch. Yes. Yeah. You know, if, if they are going into a meeting, your boss, and she needs a three-paragraph exec summary, you know, for the 11 o'clock meeting, she doesn't need a 20-page brief. Answer the question she needs now. Uh, if you, that's again, what's your goal? What is it you need to do in this situation? And so it may be that, that giving you, I mean, you, you referred to learned at hand, giving you a fact pattern that basically weaves it in with your spin. So mm -hmm. you're, you're already making the argument, but it may be that you have to present some sort of frame or focus early or answer the question. The client wants to know, can I do this or not? Yep. You know, here's the short answer. Which is like right. In, here's the short answer. In the traditional Iraq or Iraq, that's that's your first sentence or paragraph is like, here's the answer, and then now I'm going right. to lay out my reasoning in case you want you want to in find case out you more. want it, and you may yeah. want it later, or you may want it in a phone call next week, or you may want to see the memo a couple of weeks from now, or you may not need it at all. But again, that's assessing your audience and what their needs are, and not to to beat the dead horse here, but that's going to change each time out with different audiences, with different documents, with different goals. So I realized that like we've made short shrift of the sitting down and actually writing, um, which I actually think is okay because you, you mentioned something in there briefly, which is like that you, you can't write a perfect first draft. And so at some point you have to revise. And so taking note of the fact that there's a, there is more to the writing piece we acknowledge. And if we didn't get everybody completely unstuck on that, fine. But hopefully we convince people to have a structure and then sit down and do the writing. How do we approach revision? I think the deal you make with yourself to get over that block that so many people feel is you can just get it on the page and it need not be perfect. But the deal you make is you're coming back. Right. You're coming back to the document. As long as you know that you're coming back to the document, that should free you up to not have to craft the perfect first, second, third, and fourth sentence out of the box. So what do we do when we come back? Uh, you see if you've got all the information that you need and not more than the information you need. You may find out that the argument has moved or the, the presentation has moved in a somewhat different direction. And so when it comes time to, and many people advocate writing the summary of facts afterward, not to start with, but certainly if you've written it ahead of time, the facts may evolve in a slightly different way or a majorly different way from what you expected. You go back and revise that. Uh, you look to see that the argument is logical, not just logical to you, but that you've got the various transitions uh, structurally that let people know how this paragraph or this section relates to, builds on, contrasts with, is a result of uh, the paragraph or section that precedes it. Is it an example? Is it a caution? Is it a further emphasis on the same point? Is it a uh, cause and effect situation? Why is this paragraph next? Why is this section next? And making sure that you don't fall into the trap of, well, I know what I mean, 
And so therefore, they will know what I mean. It may be that some transition word or phrase or subhead or heading is necessary to make that connection clearer. So that's the place to start plugging those in on the on the rework of the document to make sure that the connections are clear. I've written down in my notes structure before sentences, which um, I take it to mean that um, before I start dealing with the minutia of punctuation and word choice, I should make sure that all of the elements of my argument or my discussion or or whatever it is I'm trying to do are are there. That I've shown all my right. work, that I've constructed the the formula and and made my point, and then I worry about the rest. Let me just throw up one caution flag to just that throwaway phrase you use, which is show all my work. Yeah. And again, that goes back to complete versus concise. There's a tendency to feel, I think, you've got to justify your work. I've spent so much time doing this and finding all these things. Let me show you everything I found. And I think you've got to be, I don't know that you meant that by, by show your work, but you certainly have to lay out your argument no, in terms I, my, of showing your work. But. I, I say that to myself all the time because I, I have a tendency to make logical leaps and so ah. um, in, my, in my writing and my thinking. And so I remind myself to show my work as I would if I were doing a math proof so that you can see how I got from point A to point B. In that way, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we agree. In that way, we agree. But you do get the feeling sometimes that people are, you know, trying to justify the uh, the the hours they spent researching or the years of tuition they they yeah. they spent uh, going through school, and that's a tendency that you have to be on guard about. But but what you're saying it to mean, um, you know, making sure the logic is clear along the way is exactly right. And let me say one other thing, if I may. Yeah. Uh, holding off on the punctuation and and that sort of stuff until later in the process is fine. Again. So long as you remember you're coming back, we can talk about that if you want to talk about proofing and things. But I think your credibility in some major degree rides on getting that stuff right, too. So I wouldn't want anybody giving short shrift that if my logic is fine, it doesn't matter if I spell the words wrong. Well, let's talk about uh, that, that because would be dangerous, it seems to me. Yeah. Sure. How, how do we approach copy editing and proofreading and when do we do that in the process? Um, I think you approach it as, as vital. Uh, I think you approach it as critical to your credibility. I think you approach it as understanding that it's harder to get people to trust you on the big things if they can't even trust you to get the small things right. Yeah. You know, uh, and so that matters a lot. Uh, different people come at it at different ways. I know people who will edit and proofread their work in multiple passes at the first time they'll look for logic and the second time they'll look for spelling and the third time they'll look for grammar and the fourth time they'll look for punctuation. Other people, and I, I put myself typically in this, this second camp, are, tr are keeping an eye out, at least I, I think I am, hope I am, uh, for each of those things on each pass. Uh, again, what are you comfortable with what, and how much time do you have? Uh, you may not have the time for five passes at, at the document, so you may need to combine a few of those. But I think the experts on this stuff, the, the uh, people who have done this longer even than I, uh, will tell you that fresh look is critical. And it may mean putting it away for a week. If you have a week, it may mean putting it down for 45 minutes and walking across the room. It may mean printing it out if you've used a screen, you're writing it on a screen, printing it out on paper because you see things differently. It may mean, uh, I've had people suggest switching fonts, just printing oh. it out in a different <laughs> font or putting it on screen in a different font because you read the words anew. Right. What about reading it out loud? That's something I'm a big fan of. That's what I was about to say. I'm an yeah. advocate of that. Absolutely. I think you'll find things in your, that your ear will find things your, your eyes don't see. Uh, one of the things in particular uh, you'll notice is if you're boring the pants off yourself, you're likely <laughs> by using the same phrase over and over and over again, you'll hear it before you'll see it. Yeah. And I think so, so you'll notice I'm coming back to that. And other times you want to repeat for emphasis or you want to use the same technical term consistently throughout the document. That's fine. But there are other times where you're just going to a default phrase unthinkingly and you might not notice it in print. But if you have to say it out loud, you're certainly going to hear it. And then there's reading it to another person or better yet, having another person reading it to you so that you're the one doing the hearing uh, in somebody else's voice. So, again, you're hearing it fresh. Uh, any of those things you can do to give you a, a new look at the document you've written, things will pop that might not otherwise pop. If you want to use spell check, be my guest. If you rely on spell check as your only way through, you're crazy. 
uh, because spell check, even the ones that are contextual, will not find everything, will not flag proper nouns by and large, so you can wind up spelling the client's name wrong or the company wrong. Um, it's an extra set of eyeballs for one more pass. Absolutely. If you want to use it, go ahead. But I would never suggest making that your only tool uh, to try to catch those things. I think that would be suicidal. How important do you think it is to, and, and this sort of goes back over everything we've talked about, but how important sure. do you think it is to adapt your writing to your perceived preferences of the audience you're writing for? Um, for example, like some judges say, you know, you must use a certain font or certain margins. Some courts have those things out there. And obviously, and you have to. If, it, obviously, you should do what they tell you you should do because exactly. they're telling you that exactly. they like it a certain way. But um, or require it. You yeah, have to or, put the jurisdictional statement in first. You're going to put the jurisdictional statement in first. I tell people I'm not advocating revolution. Right. You know, you may be able to push the bounds in certain places, but if they tell you you need this, you need this. But how how important do you think it is to say like you know I've been before Judge So and So a bunch, and I know that he uh, really seems to notice phrasal adjectives that are improperly hyphenated or something like you know like <laughs> or like what if, what if can you overthink this i guess like do you or do you think most audiences are forgiving of preferences over like i mean there are some clear mistakes but a lot of things in in grammar sure. and word choice and punctuation are preferential. Our, our judgment our yeah. judgment calls i think that's a that's a really interesting point it, it, and to me it's sort of interesting because when i discuss this in class most of the feedback i get is it's hard to do that because most of the time you don't know what judge or judges you're going to get. You don't know who's going to be on that panel. And so it's risky to try to overthink it for a particular judge. Now, if you're in the middle of a proceeding and you know that judge is taking the proceeding, assuming no emergency happens or some, something that you know, calls him or her away, uh, you can probably make those calls a little more comfortably. But I think more, more likely you're trying to play it a little more down the middle than that because you, don't, you can't be as assured um, of who the panel is going to be. Having said that, though, as, as, as we sort of were talking about earlier, Sam, a lot of the writing you do is not filing the, the formal legal document, but is correspondence, right. is catch-up, is memo uh, to a client or to somebody else. And there you have a much better sense of what the client, what their preferences may be. It might not be that they'll make a decision pro or con as it would be in, in filing a, a legal document, but it's more accessible language. Uh, I had, I had someone come up to me at a, a, a journalist session in Kentucky some years ago with what he said was a piece of folk wisdom. And it was, if you want to sell what John Smith buys, you have to see the world through John Smith's eyes. <laughs> and I thought it was right. I mean, you have to sort of continually put yourself on the other side of the table. What will this look like? What will this sound like? How am I coming across to the person I'm writing to? You notice how all this stuff sort of inter interweaves with the things we've been talking about before. Again, who, who's the audience you're going to talk to? Uh, to the extent you can scope out what their preferences are, still being what, faithful to your own voice, again, if you're writing in your voice and not writing for a senior partner whose voice you're now having to ventriloquize, uh, <laughs> I just made that, I think I just made that word up, you know, then, then I think you, to the extent you can tone it up, tone it down, casual it out, conversational it out, uh, formal it up, I think those are reasonable choices to make. I've, I've just decided, as you were talking, a, a new argument for not using two spaces between sentences just occurred to me, and that's... Um, it's a really excellent way to convey to the reader that you learned to write at or before the advent of the typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, no one yeah, will what believe do you, you're what do you younger present? than that. <laughs> yeah. How do you present yourself? And you know, I've I've seen in some writing legal writing textbooks uh, among the questions clients are asking is this person worth my time? Does this yeah. person understand my problem? And the third one was is this person from the same planet? <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, I that's think a... age is because of that uh, approach is, you know, is conveyed by that uh, tone conveys some of that. Uh, and again, if you can remember to put yourself on the other side of the table regularly, you'll be better equipped to make those kind of choices uh, in all of those areas we talked about. That's so, you know, yeah. in out, where do I put it? How do I say it? Uh, what's the goal? What do I, who's the audience I'm trying to achieve that goal for? They all fit together. Well, by way of wrapping up, um, 
what are some of the last things you do before you send a piece of writing out the door, before you hit send on the email, um, before you export the PDF and, and send it off or upload it, whatever it may be? For me, it's probably reading it aloud. Mm -hmm. And then it's reading it again on the screen one more time after that. Again, if you get a fresh set of eyes on it before it goes, all the better. If you, if you can do that, I think yes. But reading it slowly, I had, you know, this is a little more detailed than you wanted, I think. But th one of the things we didn't talk about for proofing and catching errors is reading the last paragraph up toward the top, you know, in reverse order to oh, make yeah. the paragraph again be seen, be seen fresh. It doesn't mean reading each word in backwards order, which is what I used to think people <laughs> meant by that. Reading each sentence in reverse order. Reverse order or sometimes paragraph by paragraph. Sure. But it's, it, what, what it does is it forces you to see the holes that your, may, your brain may have been filling in unconsciously because you know it, you thought you said it, and you can find out that those transitions or those extra words are not there, uh, those missing words, I shouldn't say extra words, uh, and you get to fill them in. But for me, I think reading it out loud is the, is the last shot before send, and then uh, probably crossing my fingers. <laughs> and then hit and send or upload or whatever and then it may send. be. And then send, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Rick, any parting thoughts? Anything I forgot to ask you that I you you want to make sure that we get across? Um, I think just that you have more options than you think you do. If you can keep that in mind in each of these decisions, lawyers, when they write, even writing as lawyers, even with all that's been drilled into us, still have more options than we think we do in how we convey what we know. And what I would hope people take from this conversation or from any of my classes is the ability they have to make more of those choices, take better control of their material, not to, to ignore the style book in their firm if there's a style book, not to ignore the judge saying you need the jurisdictional statement first, you need the jurisdictional statement first. But in all, all those places where you have more flexibility than you might have thought you did. Uh, to look more, a little bit more carefully and understand you've got more options available to you and to take better advantage of them. And that way you're more effective writers and that way you're more effective lawyers. I like that to end with. Rick, thanks so much for being with us today. And a pleasure. obviously pleasure. if listeners want to hear more about Rick's options for classes and things, you can check out the show notes. And primepros.com is where my website is and people can take a peek at that if they'd like to as well. Sounds good. Thanks, Rick. Thank you, Sam. Pleasure. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The Lawyerist Podcast is produced with help from Lindsay Calhoun and edited by Paul Fisher. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. Thank you.